Hello everyone, welcome to a new chapter. This is chapter 13, entitled How Cells Obtain Energy from Food. Now, this particular chapter is basically going to discuss the process of cellular respiration, which is the, um, the steps that are involved to convert energy from a sugar molecule, um, specifically glucose, into chemical energy in our ATP molecules. And in order to fully discuss it, we're going to have to take a look at the steps that are involved with cellular respiration. What are the reactants, meaning the starting reagents? What are the products for each of these steps? Uh, where exactly in the cell does it take place? And of course, along the way, we also have to take a look at all the different enzymes that are going to be used to catalyze the reaction from beginning to end. The chapter itself is divided into two main sections. Um, you have the breakdown and utilization of sugars and fats, and that is where you're going to find all the different mechanisms behind cellular respiration. And then towards the end, we're going to take a look at regulation of metabolism, meaning how can our body go about finding alternative sources if glucose is not available, as well as what are some options for storing energy-rich foods within our cells so that we have continuously access um, to the um, ingredients needed to start cellular respiration and produce ATP molecules. By now, we've had several chapters where we talk about the fact that ATP is chemical energy, courtesy of the mitochondria. We've also had chapters where we talked about the fact that the phosphate molecule, the third phosphate in an ATP molecule, is really where you have all that high energy being stored. And we have to do hydrolysis on the ATP molecules to release that energy into the system so it can be used for things like energy unfavorable reactions, such as doing things like building large molecules or dehydration. We've also discussed the fact that we utilize billions of ATP molecules on a minute by minute basis. So the process of cellular respiration is extremely important to discuss as well as to understand. So please take your time, um, read through the chapter, and then obviously listen to the lecture, and if you come across any questions, have some concerns, are not really sure, or maybe have a fantastic example to add, definitely let me know. Feel free to email me at any time. Now, the way we're going to start the story is we're going to take a look at glycolysis. And then the second part of our lecture, we're going to take a look at the citric acid cycle. Some of you might know it as the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Now, these three steps, glycolysis, citric acid cycle, slash Krebs cycle, and electron transport chain, these are the three steps that are involved in aerobic respiration. And the whole goal of respiration, um, cellular respiration, is of course to take the energy that we find in our food molecules and convert it into chemical energy, mostly by producing ATP molecules. And along the way, as we talk about the steps, you want to also keep an eye on those electrons that we find within those chemical bonds of our glucose molecules. Because those electrons are going to in have high energy that they carry as well. And we are going to be utilizing some carrier proteins, such as NADH and FADH2, to help us with our intermediate energy exchange as we go about producing our ATP molecules. So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's start taking a look at cellular respiration and dive into a little bit more detail about the first step, which is going to be glycolysis. All right, so first things first. Um, I think I always get asked whenever we discuss cellular respiration, why can't we just take our glucose molecule and just completely pull it apart and release all the energy that it houses. And it turns out that that wouldn't be a smart idea because if we were to do it in one step, just take our six carbons, because C6, H12, oh yeah, O6, that's the chemical formula for sugar. If we take these like six carbons and just literally pull them apart, it turns out that in one step it generates so much heat that not only would we be able to lose all that energy, because remember heat is very unorganized, it's entropy, it really can't be utilized within our cells, but the amount of heat that would be generated would be detrimental to the cell, and the cell would literally pop open from its release. 
So the alternative is, is that when we do our catabolic reaction, meaning that when we go about breaking down our sugar, instead of doing it in one step, we're going to do it in a step-by-step -step process. And that is then where your glycolysis, your Krebs cycle, um, also known as your citric acid cycle, and your electron transport chain are going to be so important because they're going to allow us to do it in a step-by-step -step process, better able to control the amount of heat that we're going to be releasing. And along the way, we're going to be utilizing our carriers, our activated carriers, like NADH, FADH2, as well as our ATP molecules to serve as intermediate energy carriers so that we can have a lot of useful free energy that's being created by this catabolic reaction. So we don't like to do it in one step. Too much heat would be released can't be stored and it would also be detrimental to the cell so what we're going to do instead is we're going to do it step by step now before we go on to our next slide um, i just quickly want to show you something which is if you take a look at the figure that's posted this is figure 13-1 you can see that in the process of doing cellular respiration your reactants what you're starting with is going to be our sugar molecule and that's going to be for us is going to be our glucose molecule this is our blood sugar this is the monomer to a lot of the carbs that we are consuming now for our cells we are going to be doing what we call aerobic respiration and aerobic respiration means that you're going to have to require oxygen somewhere along the way so as you can see in my formula right here or my diagram right here i have my sugar and i have my oxygen that are going to start off my process and then the end product of cellular respiration in addition to producing atp molecules and nadhs is that i'm also going to generate some waste products and those waste products are going to be carbon dioxide and water so keep an eye on those because at the end of the lecture, you want to be able to explain to me exactly where those are being produced, aka in what step, glycolysis, Krebs cycle, or electron transport chain. Now, the best way to go ahead and proceed with this catabolic uh, reaction, meaning the breakdown of our glucose molecule, is to do it in a step-by-step -step process. I've said that a few times already. And it turns out by doing so, what we can also utilize are different enzymes to catalyze the reaction. And as we're using our cat our different enzymes, they're able to generate small activated energies and thereby we can control the amount of heat that's being released. You will always have a certain degree of heat that will be released because as you guys know from our second law of thermodynamics, the transfer of energy is not 100% efficient. You do lose some in the amount of heat, so there will always be heat and entropy. But by breaking it down into smaller groups, you also are able to utilize your activated carriers, thereby having access to free energy that we can then utilize in our um, endogenic reactions or our anabolic reactions, or basically you're able to drive energetically unfavorable reactions. So here's the difference. This is figure 13.1b, and you can see instead of having a straight line that represents one step, we have the multiple breakdown utilizing different enzymes at every single step, thereby also being able to generate lots of free energy that we can utilize. Now, a little note about ATP, since it's going to be one of the main products that we're after when we do cellular respiration. Um, you can go about producing ATP, or I should say the cell goes about producing ATP in two main ways. The first way is what we discussed in our previous chapter, which is what we call substrate level phosphorylation. And that basically means that you have your ADP molecule that will go ahead and bond to a phosphate molecule, thereby being able to harvest the energy and producing an ATP molecule. So whenever you see the movement of the phosphate, um, we see that um, it is going to be called substrate level phosphorylation. 
This, of course, is famous for the fact that it likes to couple um, energy favorable reactions with energy unfavorable reactions, right? So this is what we talked about when we said your digestive system pulls apart the food bonds, releasing the energy, and then the energy that's being released is going to be stored or converted into ATP by involving an ADP and a phosphate molecule to link together and harvest the energy that way. So whenever you see that happening, that's going to be substrate level phosphorylation. The other way that we can go about producing ATP molecules, and this one tends to be the by far the most popular choice, is what we call oxidative phosphorylation. Um, you might also know it as substrate oxida oxidative phosphorylation. But either way, if you hear oxidative phosphorylation, what we see is that it will involve the mitochondria, more specifically, it will involve the inner mitochondrial membrane. And in order for us to produce ATPs on an oxidative phosphorylation level, we see that we're going to have to utilize energy from other carriers to drive the production of the ATP synthesis. So part of what we have to discuss is when we do our cellular respiration, there will be certain steps that will utilize substrate level phosphorylation, and there will be one step that will do oxidative phosphorylation. And in that step, I'll talk to you a little bit more about the fact that it takes place in the inner mitochondrial membrane, as well as we're gonna utilize energy from different carriers, so like NADH and FADH2, to go ahead and pump through the process of producing our ATP molecules. Um, so I just wanted to kind of point out the fact that those are our two mechanisms of producing ATP. Either just add a phosphate to it or utilize energy from other carriers. So that would be the distinguishment between the substrate level and oxidative phosphorylation. Now, when you take a look at the breakdown of the foods that we are consuming, our digestive system, or I should say our digestive system coupled with cellular respiration will take place in three main stages, okay? So stage one is in essence our digestive system at work. This is when you're doing the breakdown of your large food molecules, our macromolecules, into their monomers. So on my little diagram by stage one, I'm gonna see the mention of my proteins become amino acids. My polysaccharides, my carbs, are broken down into simple sugars. And my fats are broken down into fatty acids and into glycerol. Stage one of the breakdown is gonna take place um, what we call outside of the individual cells. And what I mean with that is that you are actively chewing your food, Breaking it down, as you swallow it, it travels down your GI tract. Your GI tract, which obviously involves organs like the stomach, the small and the large intestines, they will go ahead and hydrolyze the food molecules. And when this is happening, this is an example of what we call extracellular digestion. It's happening outside of our individual cells because it's happening within the lumen, the opening of your GI tract. When the food molecules are small enough, so they're down to the monomers, and they pass down through the small intestines, we see that the small intestines are able to do what we call absorption. Absorption means that the molecules are small enough to leave the GI tract and actually go into the cell and start doing their cellular respiration. When these molecules are able to enter into the cell, as you can see with the little arrow right here, we then go ahead and move on to stage number two. And stage number two is gonna occur in the cytosol of the cell, or I should basically remember cytosol is the jelly, the cytoplasmum is the area, but it takes place in the cytosol slash cytoplasm. And this step is gonna be all about taking my simple sugar molecules like my glucose and breaking it down into pyruvate um, and then eventually converting it into what we like to call acetyl-CoA. Now, if you look at your diagram, you're gonna notice that regardless of if you start off with proteins, polysaccharides or fats, and you break those down into their monomers, you will always have a path that will lead you to the production of acetylcholine. So here you can see my uh, amino acids can be converted into pyruvate or acetylcholine. 
my polysaccharides, of course, go to pyruvates and acetylcholine, and then my fats are able to be converted into acetyl-CoA as well. So regardless of which starting material you use, you always will have the ending of acetyl-CoA at the end of stage number two. Now I will let you know that we will focus primarily on our glucose molecules because they're able to increase the effectiveness of the cellular respiration and they're able to generate the most ATP molecules and it's also the most commonly used reactant. So that is why we're going to focus on glucose and then towards the end, we'll talk a little bit about what happens if your body doesn't have access to polysaccharides, doesn't have access to glucose, how would it affect the system? Either way, by the end of stage number two, you have generated acetyl-CoA. You've also released a little bit of ATP and produced some NADH molecules. You can see them in your diagram in the red boxes and the green. And then our final stage, stage three, this is now when we're gonna go ahead and take our acetyl-CoA and completely break apart its bonds so we can go ahead and release all the energy that's being housed by producing lots of NADH and FH ADH2 carriers and eventually utilizing oxidative phosphorylation to convert that energy into our ATP molecules. And as we're doing our third step, this will involve the mitochondria most of the time. There are some exceptions to the rules, like when we take a look at um, aerobic bacteria. If they're able to complete the third step, they will still have to utilize their cytoplasm because they don't have the mitochondria organelle. Either way, along the way, when we do step three, we're going to have to discuss the fact that your body will be generating carbon dioxide as a waste product. We also get a little bit of that in stage two, as well as water molecules. And at the end of stage three, we have successfully converted the energy from our food molecules into our ATP molecules. So if we go ahead and take a look all the way at the bottom of our illustration right here, we're going to see that our net results are going to involve food mixing together with the requirement of an oxygen molecule. And by doing so, we're able to generate the results of producing ATP molecules, NADH, as well as the waste product of carbon dioxide and water. Now, I didn't tell you about the oxygen. My apologies. I said to you before that this chapter is mostly about aerobic respiration because it requires an oxygen molecule somewhere along the way. And spoiler alert, that oxygen molecule is going to be important in our third stage where it will serve as a final electron carrier, thereby maximizing how much ATP molecules we'll able to generate. This is also one of the reasons why water is produced as a waste product. So that's just a little snippet of the quote-unquote fun that is about to come our way. And let's go ahead and let's start with our glycolysis. So this is after the food has broken down our, mo our macromolecules into monomers, and the cells now have access to glucose molecules. What are we going to do? So let's enter our stage two according to this diagram which for us is going to be the start of cellular respiration. And cellular respiration will start off with glycolysis. All right, so glycolysis is step number one in aerobic respiration. And as you can see in the name, it's all about glyco, which is our glucose molecule. Lysis is to pull it apart. So the main goal is to take your glucose molecule and through a series of 10 steps, it's going to go ahead and literally split the six carbon molecule into two, three carbon molecules. And these are going to be called your pyruvates. And as you are splitting apart the glucose, along the way, you'll be able to generate some NADHs. Remember, these are going to be our high energy electron carriers because the electrons that we're holding together, the carbons, are full of usable energy. So we don't want to lose it. So we're going to take those electrons that are being released and we're going to attach them to an NAD producing NADH. So that's our high energy electron carriers. And we're also going to go ahead and be able to create some ATP molecules. Now, it turns out that you produce four, 
but you will actually use two to keep the whole process running. So that's why the net result is going to say right here at the bottom, two ATP molecules. So at the end, you get two pyruvates and you get two NADHs. That's your end result of glycolysis. And my apologies, that is a horrible highlight. Let's try it again. There we go. Oh, and then it stopped. I think my mouse might need a new battery. Okay. Either way, that's the net result. Now for glycolysis, we want to know where does it take place? It takes place in the cytosol. So it takes place within the jelly of the cytoplasm, right? Um, what are going to be the starting reagents of glycolysis? That's going to be our glucose molecule. All right. Now, what do we get out of glycolysis? We're going to get our two pyruvates. We're going to get our two ATPs and we're going to get our two NADHs. Now, does this step involve oxygen? Absolutely not. And because it doesn't involve oxygen, we have been able to, utilizing research, obviously, and the scientific method, um, come to the conclusion that glycolysis is the most ancient of the three pathways of what we discuss when we do cellular respiration. So glycolysis was the first one to be developed, and we see that every single living entity, every single cell, whether it's a eukaryotic, prokaryotic cell, is able to generate or produce glycolysis. And that's because it doesn't require oxygen, nor does it require any specialized organelle because it simply takes place within the cytosol of the cytoplasm. Now, much of the energy that's gonna be released from glucose hydrolysis is gonna be used to drive the production, as you can see, of our ATP molecules. But also keep in mind that, as I've mentioned to you before, we're also gonna be able to generate some NADHs because they're gonna be our high energy carriers because the, elect the high energy carriers that are gonna hold on to the electrons that were utilized to form that initial glucose bond. So at the end of your glycolysis, you're going to have your two pyruvate molecules. And because you still have molecules that have bonds, that means that you can continue to break them down and obviously produce or release more free energy, as well as heat. That will become the job of our other steps. But we need to go ahead and take a look at exactly how we go from glucose to pyruvate. And as I mentioned to you before, it's gonna be a process that's gonna take 10 steps and each step will come with its own specific enzyme. So let's go ahead and click over and take a look at a table that you can also find in your book. So right over here, we see that we have um, a set of different enzymes. Here's your kinases, isomerase, dehydrogenase, and mutase. And it just tells you their different functions and their role in glycolysis. And what we now need to do is we need to take a look at the 10 steps. You see it right here? Step one, all the way to step 10 that are involved in converting that one molecule of glucose into two molecules of pyruvate. And along the way, what we're gonna see happening is that the goal is to obviously not only produce lots of ATP molecules, and by the way, all the ATP produced in glycolysis will be done to substrate level phosphorylation. And we're gonna house those high energy electron carriers that we get by severing the covalent bonds in the form of our NADH molecules. So go ahead and take a look at the illustration on your right hand side and it summarizes what the goal of the steps are. So step one through three, its goal is to utilize an energy investment which will be recoup later. Then we have steps four and five which are gonna be interested in actually cleaving the glucose molecule and going from a six carbon sugar to two, three carbon sugars. And then steps six through 10 are all about generating as much energy as we possibly can. So we're gonna invest some energy. That's why we need those two ATP molecules. Then we're gonna start the actual process of lysing the glucose. And once we lyse the glucose, we have to make sure that the electrons are being captured by the NADH molecule, and we're able to go ahead and do substrate level phosphorylation to generate our ATP molecules. 
Now I have some really good news for us. We are going to spend some time and take a look at those 10 steps individually. <gasps> I heard the excitement. Yes, I heard it. Let's take a look. I promise it's not as painful as it sounds. <laughs> All righty. So let's go ahead and take a look at the steps. And remember, as we're looking at the steps, we want to keep an eye on what our ultimate goal is. Step one, two, and three are all about utilizing and making an energy investment. So this is where we're going to have to utilize our two ATP molecules. This is obviously in the start of doing our glycolysis. Now, the way the steps are going to run is that any area that's highlighted in blue, that is going to be the part of the molecule that will undergo some type of shift, whether it's a chemical conformation um, or a molecular shift. That's the part that's going to be changing. In yellow, and that's where you come in, because this is the part that's going to be really important, we have to go ahead and make sure that we point out the specific name of the enzyme that's involved in each step. And each one will have a very unique one that will take care of the whole process. Um, you can also take a look at the arrows. A single arrow will indicate the fact that it's an irreversible reaction. And obviously, the tip of the arrow will point towards the product. If you have a double-headed arrow like you do right here in step number two, then what we're doing is we're showcasing that you potentially could have a reversible step, meaning it can go either way. All right, so let's dive back in and let's see what's happening over here. Now remember, step one, two, and three, we're not breaking the molecule apart completely just yet. We're just basically doing our energy investment of utilizing those two required ATP molecules to get everything started. All right, so it says for you right here on step one, it says glucose is phosphorylated by ATP to form a sugar phosphate. The negative charge of the phosphate prevents passage of the sugar phosphate through the plasma membrane, trapping the glucose inside the cell. The enzyme that's going to be important for step number one is going to be the hexokinase kinase enzyme, hexokinase enzyme. I would recommend that as you're taking your notes, keep an eye on the name of the enzyme because those could be easy questions that I can derive from you. I can give you the name of the enzyme and then ask you in which step of glycolysis it takes place. All right, so step number two is going to be a reversible one. Notice the double arrows. Our enzyme of choice is going to be the phosphoglucose isomerase. And this one, what we see happening is that we're going to start moving the carbonyl oxygen from carbon one to carbon two. And when you do that, what's happening is that you start forming a ketose form uh, from an aldose sugar. So you can see we have the irreversible transformation between the glucose 6 phosphate and the fructose 6 phosphate. So, so far, we haven't really pulled the glucose molecule apart. We have simply invested some ATP molecules, and we're starting to rearrange, starting to move around um, some um, carbons. Step three is going to go ahead and involve the phosphofructokinase enzyme. And in step number three, let's see what it says. It says the new hydroxyl group on carbon one is phosphorylated by ATP in preparation for the formation of two, three carbon sugar phosphates. The entry of sugars into glycolysis is controlled at this step. Thus regulation of the enzo of the enzyme phosphofructokinases. Beautiful. All right, we are getting there. And then step number four is going to be very important for us because this is when we actually physically cleave our glucose molecule with the six carbons. Because it's still a six carbon sugar regardless of the changes that we've made in, in step one, two, and three. We're going to go ahead and take our six carbon sugar and we're going to cleave it or lyse it and be able to produce our two, three carbon molecules. Now, out of the production of those two, three carbon molecules, what we're going to end up seeing is that only your glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, here, right here at the end, will be able to continuously move on to the next step 
um, or I should say through glycolysis, being able to generate the um, extraction of energy. The other products are going to be a little bit more involved in step number five. Um, the enzyme for step number four is aldolase. Here you go. I also wanted to point out something that I didn't do before. Remember how we said that you require two ATP molecules to get everything started for gluco uh, glycolysis? We used one ATP molecule in step number one, and the second ATP molecule is being utilized in step number three. My apologies for not pointing that out earlier. Step number five is going to concentrate on the other products that weren't able to proceed. And what we see happening here is that we're going to have our dihydroxic acetate phosphate. It's going to go ahead and become isomerized um, to go ahead, meaning we're going to break it down a little bit further and convert its shape into the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The enzyme that's going to be involved in this step is called the triose phosphate isomerase. Here you go. Now, step six and step seven, I put them together on the same slide because in a little bit, we're going to talk about how they are coupled together. Um, step six and seven are an excellent way to showcase how you can link an energy unfavorable reaction and an energy favorable reaction, which I've known we've discussed in our previous chapter, but personally, I don't think we can ever have enough examples of a nice process. So that's why I kind of merged them together, because in a little bit, we're going to discuss what they have in common. I'm sorry, how they are coupled together, not what they have in common, but how they are coupled together. So let's take a look at step six. It says the two molecules of the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which you were generating in step four and five, are now oxidized. The energy generating phase of glycolysis begins, right? So now we're going to start harboring as much NADH and ATP molecules as we can. And the first step is that we can see that we have the introduction of our NAD right here which means it's going to trap those high energy electrons that are roaming around. And then also we have our phosphate floating around. And what we can see happening right here is that we're going to utilize our glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme. In step seven, we see that it's time now to produce some ATP. So what we see happening is that we have a transfer of the phosphate molecules as well as a high energy phosphate, I'm sorry, the transfer of an ADP along with a high energy phosphate molecule. We're going to link that together and we're going to utilize the phosphoglyceride kinases enzyme to go ahead and come up with our final product. So step six and step seven are coupled together. Also, step six and seven are going to be able to start giving us energy um, production out of the glucose molecule with the production of NADH as well as our ATP molecule. Now, keep in mind that the ATP molecule is going to be utilizing um, ATP phosphorase um, and substrate level phosphorylation, excuse me. Um, so simply the transfer of the phosphate to the ADP molecule is going to be done in glycolysis, substrate level phosphorylation. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes all these abbreviations get me very tongue-tied, so my apologies. All righty, so we're almost there. We have a few more steps to go. Okay, but before we get to those steps, let's talk about our coupled reaction. So as I said to you, the whole purpose of six and seven, um, to kind of pull them aside, is because we see this beautiful example where you have energy unfavorable reactions that are going to be utilized, are going to be linked together to energy favorable reactions so that we can utilize their energy, um, their net energy loss to go ahead and fuel each other. So over here, what we're seeing is that we're going to have an oxidation of an aldehyde to a carboxyl acid. And that's the whole goal of, seven, of six and seven. So go ahead and take a look at the picture that's inserted on your right hand side. And as you can see, you have step number six, you have step number seven. And more importantly, what you're going to notice is that they've utilized either red arrows or blue arrows. Now, the red arrows or I guess they're kind of orangey, are going to be unfavorable reactions. 
where the blue arrows are going to be energy favorable reactions. And what we see happening in step six, we have two energy unfavorable reactions that we're trying to do. We are trying to go ahead and form a high energy phosphate bond. And we're also trying to do our formation of our NADH, right? We're building the NAD plus our high energy electron to produce NADH. In order to do both of these, both of these involve the building, which means that both of them are an example of an energy unfavorable reaction. We're going to have them coupled together to the hydrogen carbon bond oxidation energy. And by doing that, starting the process of the oxidation of the aldehyde, we see that we generate so much free energy because it's an energy favorable reaction that that energy can then turn around and be utilized immediately to run the two energy unfavorable reactions. Now, how is it coupled to step number seven? Well, as you can see, one of the goals of step six is the formation of your high energy phosphate bond. Once that phosphate bond has generated its product, we see that it will immediately be broken down. So we'll utilize some hydrolysis. And when that phosphate is hydrolyzed, meaning it's removed, remember that would be an example of an energy favorable reaction because we are lysing, we're pulling it apart, we're breaking the bond, we're releasing that energy. And that energy from the energy favorable reaction can then be utilized its remaining free energy to allow the phosphate to bind to the ADP molecule, thereby forming ATP molecule. And the formation of ATP, obviously because it is involved with building, is an example of an energy unfavorable reaction. So as you can see, the, one of the products of step number six is what is utilized in step number seven to drive or to conduct an energy favorable reaction whose energy is then utilized to go ahead and form your ATP molecule. So we are very interested in this because it turns out that the total energy change, if you compare steps six and seven, is a very favorable one, allowing us to generate NADH as well as ATP molecules along the way, all by oxidizing an aldehyde into a carboxylic acid. So we're able to release energy in different forms. It's a fantastic way to kind of show a coupled reaction. So once again, how an energy unfavorable reaction can be completed by linking it with an energy favorable reaction. All right, back to our steps we go. So in step number eight, remember the whole goal of um, moving on to step six and beyond is to generate as much energy as we can from the bonds of splitting apart our glucose molecules into our pyruvate molecules. So we've had a little generation so far in step six and seven. Let's take a look at what step eight and nine bring us. We see that in step eight, it says the remaining phosphate ester linkage in the three phosphoglyceride, which has a relatively low energy of hydrolysis, is moved from carbon three to carbon two, to form the 2-phosphoglycerate. The enzyme that we're going to utilize in step number eight is going to be the phosphoglycerase mutase. Beautiful. This is also an example of a reversible reaction. We also see another reversible reaction occurring in step number nine. Step number nine, we'll use the analase enzyme, and it's all about the removal of the water from the 2-phosphoglycerate to create a high energy enol phosphate linkage. All right. And then our final step is step number 10, and it's gonna give us some more ATP because we see we're able to do some substrate level phosphorylation by transferring our high energy phosphate from our phosphoenol pyruvate, allowing it to link to our ADP molecule and utilizing our pyruvate kinesis enzyme. And at the end of the day, we see that we have our pyruvate molecule, right? And we have our ATP molecules that are being generated as well in this final step. So the net results of glycolysis is that we need to start off with a molecule of glucose 
we do not require oxygen. This is all occurring within the cytosol or cytoplasm of the cell. And it will require two ATP molecules in the start as an energy investment. It will take 10 steps to get everything done. And at the end of the day, or I should say at the end of glycolysis, we are going to walk away with two NADHs. Those are our high energy electron carriers. Two overall ATP molecules are going to be our net. So I'm going to cross these out because they're going to cancel each other out. And then last but not least, we have two molecules of pyruvate. And those pyruvates are still full of energy. So they're going to be able to transition us over to the next step of the electro, um, of the cellular respiration, which is going to be our Krebs cycle or our citric acid cycle, whichever name you want to go about. Now, one thing I want to tell you is as you're sitting there and you're going through your 10 steps, the way I want you to think about the 10 steps is I don't want you to necessarily memorize all the intermediate sugars that were generated between the glucose and the pyruvate. Instead, I want you to concentrate on which enzyme was used for which step. So keep an eye on that yellow box with the enzymes names. I also want you to keep an eye on the facts that if you're taking a look at your 10 steps of glycolysis, that your step one through three was all about making that energy investment. Step four and five is when you actually start cleaving the glucose molecule into the three carbon sugar. And then steps six through 10 is where you're gonna be able to generate your energy carriers. So that is where your ATP and your NADHs will come into play. You also wanna keep in mind what was required to start glucose, um, to start glycolysis, that would be your glucose molecule. Where does it take place within the cytosol of the cytoplasm? The fact that it doesn't require oxygen to proceed. And that in essence is where I, and then the fact that it does um, phosphate level, subs, uh, substrate level phosphorylation to produce its ATP. I don't know why I keep um, switching the words, substrate level phosphorylation for ATP. So I do not need you to memorize all 10 steps from beginning to end. I do need you to know the name of the enzymes, and I do need you to know the breakdown of what the purposes of the steps. And all of that can be referenced in the image that I have posted for you. I believe it is on slide eight, where it says overview of glycolysis. You have the nice image on your right-hand side with the 10 steps, showing you which one is for our energy deposit, which one is for the cleaving of the six carbon to the three carbon, and which one is for the energy production of our ATP and our NADH. Now, one little last note about glycolysis. Um, we know that we're able to generate ATP without oxygen. And what we see happening is that when you discuss cellular respiration, so the process of breaking the glucose molecule into oxygen, you have different options as to what you can discuss. So in our case, we're discussing aerobic respiration, meaning that we're gonna do our three steps, of glycolysis, our strict acid cycle, electron transport chain, and we're gonna use oxygen somewhere along the way, hence the name aerobic respiration. You can also do anaerobic respiration, and anaerobic respiration means that you're gonna do all three steps, but you're not gonna utilize oxygen. You're gonna use another molecule um, along the way. So for instance, cows. Cows do glycolysis, they do the citric acid cycle, they do the electron transport chain, but they never utilize oxygen. Instead, they use carbon dioxide. And because they use carbon dioxide, we see that their ATP production is a little bit lower, but also that one of the waste products they generate is methane. So think about that along the way. And then the other way is that you can do fermentation. Fermentation is when you're only interested in doing the first step. So you're only doing glycolysis. Um, it is basically just a one-step process. Um, obviously, it's still occurring within the cytosol of the cytoplasm. 
Obviously, it still doesn't require any specialized organelles, and it's going to go ahead and not need oxygen to occur. The problem with fermentation is that it only gives you small amounts of ATP molecules, because as we've just seen with our discussion of glycolysis, the net result is really just two ATP molecules and some NADHs. But the reason that fermentation is so effective or utilized is because often you'll come across it when you take a look at anaerobic microorganisms or any type of unicellular organism, like for instance yeast, as well as bacteria that's anaerobic. Because the organisms are so small, they can get away with just doing fermentation and utilizing the little heaps of ATP molecules that are being produced. It's also a very quick step, and because it's quick, the way it's going to work, and you can take a look at the illustration that's on the right-hand side, your glucose molecule will go into glycolysis. That's the only step it will do. It will give you a little bit of ATP, but more importantly, what we see happening is that we have this continuous recycling of our NADH molecules. And because you have this continuous recycle, it's able to generate and work through the glycolysis step over and over and over again. So it's giving you like these little bursts of small enough ATPs. Now, believe it or not, we as humans also can do fermentation. We usually do fermentation whenever we do an activity where we utilize a lot of our ATP molecules. Um, so for instance, exercising. When you start exercising, you utilize a heap load of ATP molecules. And sometimes, especially if we're trying to condition ourselves, or it's been a while since we've been in the gym, we're going to notice that after a short period of time, we're getting really tired. We're going to notice that we're breathing faster because our body's trying to take in as much oxygen as it can so it can keep speeding up aerobic respiration. And for many of us, we're also going to start noticing a sharp pain. We're going to have those muscle pains. Um, some of us will also get a, um, like a sharp sensation in our chest, almost like a burning sensation. That, ladies and gents, is lactic acid. And the reason you get lactic acid is because it's a side product of doing fermentation. The glucose molecule is converted into pyruvate, which is converted due to NAD regeneration into lactate. Now, lactate burns, which is the pain that we're feeling, and the burning sensation is meant to slow you down so that our body can then switch back over to aerobic respiration. Now, the good news is if you keep up with your exercise, then our body will quickly learn that you need to utilize, need to generate more ATP molecules, which means that it starts to condition the body to do vigorous activities without running out of it and having to switch over to fermentation. So that you'll see that you can run longer or you can lift heavier without feeling that sensation of getting out of breath. In microorganisms such as yeast, the generation of just a handful of ATP molecules is just enough for them, obviously, to maintain um, life and homeostasis. But we as humans has, oh, have also figured out the trick that in fermentation in yeast, for instance, the pyruvate molecule is converted to ethanol as well as carbon dioxide. And we have figured out that we can use that ethanol for making things like alcoholic beverages, such as beer and wines. And we've also utilized the fact that we can use that carbon dioxide in things like baking. So we can use that gas that's generated. We can utilize that in the process to help our breads rise or cupcakes rise. So we actually take fermentation in yeast, and that's one of the reasons why in the grocery store you can find packets of yeast, because people will utilize it in their baking recipes or if they're interested in brewing their own alcoholic beverages, they'll do that. And the ingredients will often call for you to mix the yeast with sugar, because sugar is where your glucose comes in, and then you just kind of let it sit and do its fermentation and generate the carbon dioxide and ethanol molecules, depending on what you're looking for. All right, so just to recap, fermentation is just one step, glycolysis. It doesn't require oxygen. Um, it takes place in the cytosol slash cytoplasm. It's often seen in microorganisms and anaerobic um, 
microorganisms, whether they're aerobic or anaerobic, I should say. We also should point out, or I should also point out, that at the bottom right there I wrote for you that there are some bacteria that can do anaerobic respiration, meaning that they can utilize all three steps, glycolysis, citric acid, and electron transport chain. When they do this, though, because they are bacteria and they're prokaryotic, they will not utilize the mitochondria because they don't have that organelle. Instead, all three reactions will continue to occur within the cytoplasmic region. Alrighty, I am going to stop right here. And then as we meet for our next part of Chapter 13, we are going to go ahead and take a look at the second step of cellular respiration, which is our citric acid cycle, and obviously also the third step, which is going to be the electron transfer chain, as well as some of the regulation of the metabolic abilities of our cells. All right, we shall talk soon.